Hey, what's going on, guys? It's Brian and Jack from Superman's Comics, and we have a great show planned for you tonight. We're going to be talking about the week's hottest comic book releases. We're talking about first appearances, reader buzz, variant buzz, and a long-term play. And all that is happening right here on the CBSI Bolo Show. But before we get into that, Jack, how has your week been? Been good, Brian. You know, it's spirit week for my kids at school, so they've been busy dressing up every day. And of course, tomorrow or today, when you're watching, this is Halloween. So a lot of uh, family fun and excitement, but busy week. That's right. This is pre-recorded. We record it Wednesday night, but it premieres Thursday. And my kid is also excited. Tomorrow's character day. So he has Shazam costume and he has his little Shazam book to take in that goes with the character. But... We also had a new video premiere last night. I say premiere. is the first of a new weekly series. It wasn't really a live premiere, but it was three up, three down, where we cover three hot and three cold market trends in the comic hobby. Small, digestible content, as you, the viewer, have requested. But we have our long-form show tonight, and that is the Bolo List. And you may be asking, what exactly is the Bolo list. It is the be on the lookout list, as we said, covering those first appearances, reader buzz, and variant buzz. And this comes out every Wednesday morning, Tuesday night, right, Jack? Absolutely. And again, you know, we get a lot of requests on a weekly basis. Can it come out earlier? Can it come out earlier? But with the integrity of the list being at the most important, um, we want to make sure that we drop this list kind of like as late as we can to get as much information as we can while still giving you the the comic shopper the opportunity to have this list before those east coast lcs is open and you can go ahead and uh you know hit that new release wall and feel like you know you have a good idea of what other people are talking about and again to be on the lookout list it's not my list it's not brian's list it's not our personal picks this is what you on social media are talking about what all of you out there in the community are buzzing about Right. Like he said, it is a static list. So it's a snapshot at a point in time, usually late Tuesday, early Wednesday. But as the new cycle changes and new stuff comes out, new comic book day, we are unable to make changes to the list because at that point it's already out there and published. Enough talking about it. And we're going to get into it right now, starting with the first appearances this week. And the first one book we're and the first book we're going to talk about is Dead Man Logan number 12. Yeah, this is probably the most commented on and talked about book, Brian, on this list. So the Bolo rants have been gone for a while, and I'm not going to get into a major rant about this, but we are going to discuss some of the things that have been brought up as it relates to this book. This is the first appearance of Daniel, C Daniel Cage as um, Thor. Um, and the reality is, yes. If you read issue number 11, on the last page, we see Danielle pick up the hammer. We see her put the armor on. It's one of those great last page, splash page kind of surprise endings. Now, if you've watched Simpleman's Comics YouTube channel at all, right, Brian? Everyone knows where I stand on this, right? Everybody knows that I'm a believer of a first appearance is a first appearance. So if you're asking me what do I think the first appearance of Danielle Cage as Thor is, of course, I think it's issue number 11. So the question has been asked, and and I've answered it several times today, why is it on this list today with number 12? Well, the answer to that, quite simply, is if I omitted it, I would get the same amount of questions from the opposite end asking me, why is it not on this list when others, and, and very loudly, are proclaiming it as the first full appearance. Now we have seen within the market that last page splash pages are oftentimes not respected as first appearances. And while I may not agree with that, and you may be very familiar with my argument with Hulk 180 and Hulk 181, I think we all can agree in the comic community that the consensus in the market, at least within the majority, is that Hulk 181 is Wolverine's kind of market first appearance. Again, it may not be what I personally believe, but it's what the community has decided. And we have to use that as kind of a standard then going forward. So this was put on the first appearance list as it is, you know, a first full appearance. Now, did we have Dead Man Logan 11 previously on this list? No. And we did not include it 
as a first appearance this time because we didn't last time. We didn't last time because no one saw that coming. We didn't have that information. That wasn't something that was given to us by a retailer or an advanced reader or a publisher. We did not know that that was going to happen in the issue. And yes, we were aware coming into this issue that that had happened last month. But again, being that it was one of those last page splash page, we already know what this book is going to be titled by many in the community. Now, I know some of you may not agree. Some of you may feel that 11 is the first appearance. This is why I hate this entire argument. This has been my entire point. I don't like the fact that we have to debate every first appearance that comes out. I think there should be a cut and dry rule. But guys, don't shoot the messenger. The reality is there isn't a cut and dry rule. And this is what is going to continue to happen with first appearances coming out in modern books that hit shelves on new comic book day we're gonna get that debate so i think that this will be looked at as a first full appearance i think that 11 will be looked at as a cameo in the long run doesn't necessarily mean i agree probably both books have solid value this is also the first appearance of the wasteland avengers that future avengers team that we now know is going to get a mini series in january that we saw the solicitation for about six days ago so this book has legs for multiple reasons. Um, I don't know if this Dead Man Logan, Old Man Logan, Old Man Quill type of stuff is going to have any sort of real long-term success in the market. We've already seen an Old Man Logan style movie from Fox. I don't know that that's the route the MCU is going to go. My gut would tell me that we're going to get a young Wolverine cast in the movie. But nonetheless, the collectors are definitely buzzing about these books. And, you know, I don't begrudge anyone who asked the question today at all. Anyone who um, kind of commented, whether it was on Facebook or Instagram or on the CBSI website or some of you that commented on multiple places, I saw that. Um, I don't begrudge you for asking that question. I just hope you understand what we say on the intro of the show. This is not... Mr. Bolo's list, this is not Brian's list, this is not Simpleman's Comics list, it's certainly not CBSI's list. This is your list. This is what you guys are talking about, and this is what people within the community are talking about. And when we see eBay listings, listing it as first full appearance ahead of its release, when we see um, sources like the Key Collector app listing it as a first full appearance, we know that that's the way the market's going to look at it, at least in the initial stage, and that's why it's labeled as such on this list. I understand why people bring up the Hulk 180, 181, because it's always hyperbole when you come into this type of argument. But realistically, 399 plus 399 equals 798. Spend that much, buy both copies, and then you will have the first appearance, whether it's the number 11, number 12, whichever the market decides. Eight, $8 buy-in, you're good. Yeah, we oftentimes, we talk about this, we see sets sell better, right? The, the combination of the two tending to do better than any individual listing. But this is where it comes into comic politics, Brian, because you know some people are already invested in 11. So those who are already invested in 11 don't want to see us talk about 12. And those who didn't get 11, they want to champion 12. And this is where, unfortunately, this comes into play. Yeah, I don't talk about comic politics because just... You're never going to change someone's mind one way or another. Everyone's no. going to debate the same thing until they're blue in the face. The good thing is, Dead Man Logan's been a great story. I also liked um, Old Man Hawkeye, but Dead Man Logan, great book. So either way, pick it up for just the great story alone and then get the first appearance as a bonus. Yeah, that's the winners in this one, Brian, the readers. So. And then the next one we're going to talk about, this was actually a really popular book. I was surprised, especially with how many covers, how many people are talking about this book this week, and that's Excalibur number one. Yeah, Brian, you know what? This is one you and I were very um, down on, right? When we talked about this book on the last call show, you and I kind of have a similar opinion on this, like um, British sect of the X-Men. Um, and we've never really seen, it seems like people have always championed this team, this uh, these characters, and we've never truly seen it take off. Having said that, I saw what you saw today, Brad. A lot of positive reviews for the series. We're going to talk a lot about comics that got negative reviews from readers today. There was several of those issues on this list. But this was not one of them. This, this was not one that we saw that. We saw a lot of positive reviews. So this is one that I wasn't really – I mean I knew I'm going to read it, but it wasn't one that I was like 
high up on my list to read and now I'm excited to read. So let us know in the comment section, did you read Excalibur? What are your opinions of it? Are you, you are you a big X-Men fan? Are you reading everything X-Men? Um, did this one catch you off guard? We would love to hear from you. Right. I plan to read it digitally and if I like it, I'll go back and pick up a copy. But yeah, I was surprised to see how many people were talking. Even even at the LCS, not even just online, people were talking. It was funny because my little, the smaller satellite for Third Eye Comics, uh, God bless them because they were dealing, new comic book day, and they were dealing without power right at opening. So it was old school. I mean, I traded like three wheels of cheese for my comics today. <laughs> <laughs> not really, but yeah, there was all calculator and cash box and then taking the swipe on the on the cell phone. So uh, shout out to, to Sean and Ashley at Third Eye who were, they didn't they didn't skip a beat, man. But, Find a way to get it done. Yeah. Then the last book on the first appearances this week was Joker Killer Smile. This was another right, one this, of those prestige format books. Yep, another uh this is uh Jeff Jeff Lemire. Um you get the team behind Gideon Falls here with him and Andrea Sorrentino. Um this one I think had a little less fanfare. I think we've we've kind of OD'd on some of these Joker books, and I think we've OD'd on some of these Black Label books. But this is one I like as a sleeper. Um, now, I did not get a chance yet to read this book. It's New Comic Book Day today. I read a few books. This was not one that I've gotten a chance to read. So the first appearance in this book is Mr. Smiles. Now, this was teased in the solicitation, so we knew this was coming. Um, the question really is going to become, who is Mr. Smiles? What, what are their legs? Now, if you read this book and you have an opinion, please weigh in in the comments. Again, we'd love to hear from you guys. We want this to be an interactive show. At the same point, I think regardless, this being the first issue, these are questions that are going to get answered over time. Either way, I love that cover B. I think that cover B is awesome. It's a great depiction of Joker. Um, and, you know, I'm all in for this Joker stuff. I'm still on a high from the Joker movie, a movie that I wasn't really going in with a lot of expectations, but I enjoyed. Um, I'm not one of those people who thinks it's the greatest movie of all time, but it was a good movie. And you and I talked about this, Brian, last night off air. Like, I'm all in for comic book movie and TV content, regardless of what it is. Yeah, I still haven't had a chance to see Joker yet. Having said that, that's actually going to wrap up the first appearance section for us. So real quick, before we get into the reader buzz, do us a favor, click that thumbs up button. But before we get into reader buzz, stay tuned because right at the end of this Bolo show, we actually have a video that's going to go live on Simple Men's Comics channel. And it is going to be the back issue Bolo. It's going to be the first of that video series. We're going to talk, what are we talking about? Five Marvel books, right? Right, modern marvels. These are five books that may have been hot at one point or another, but they're they're newer books within the last few years since about 2015, and there is a good chance they are still sitting in your LCS, whether it's in back issue bins, whether it's still on that new release wall, or may even be in some discount bins. Right, and like I said, that will go live on the channel as soon as we're done with the Bolo Show tonight, so stay tuned for that, and we're going to go right now into the Reader Buzz section for this week, and keeping with that whole... Joker type theme, we get Harleen number two. Yeah, Harleen number one was a big smash success, not just for readers who I think were very excited to get kind of the depiction of Harley Quinn that a lot of us were kind of hoping for, but it did really well from a speculation standpoint. Um, the book was trading at one point, I haven't checked on it lately, but for as much as $20, um, I think that because of when the solicitation for issue number two was, I could see this book creeping to that sort of a level because we talk about it. We have the FOC show, the last call show. FOC is big for comic book retailers. Um, it's when they can get those orders in. And when FOC hit for this book, it was already before the point of number one dropping. So because of that, you know, retailers may not have been able to predict the success. And we know that retailers have a tendency to order less of issue number two than they do of issue number one. I also really like that cover A. I think um, you see so much of like a, um, not to be sappy, but like a negative depiction of Joker and Harley's relationship for good reason. I think kind of the sweetness of the curve, yet the sinisterness of Joker's face um, really is a great depiction of, of kind of the, the Harley Quinn Joker relationship. Um, 
I would, again, love to know what people are thinking about this series. I think a lot of people were skeptical going into issue number one, and it seemed to have flipped a lot of people. We heard from a lot of people that they weren't, they weren't, they didn't need another Harley Quinn um, origin story. But I think when you're putting this book up against the Harley Quinn ongoing series, which is essentially a comedy book, um, this book is bound to do well. It's totally grasping at straws here, but yeah, cover A to me kind of reminds me like a close up, different view of that DC Presents cover with the whole Harley and Joker. But uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah, and um, my my wife was reading Harleen. Like I said, she's new in the comic book reading, but she did read Harleen. Now you you did say they were going for about twenty. Now was this one the MSRP was it seven ninety nine? I think it was five ninety nine. I can't. I mixed it up between Joker Killer Smile and this one. One was seven ninety nine. One was five ninety nine. I mm-hmm. believe. So something. Yeah, to be it, aware might, it of. could have. It could have been this one. I know that the um, the prestige ones tend to go for a little bit more. I will say, I saw your wife's Facebook post talking about reading this book, and I couldn't help but think, oh no, be careful with that book. That's a hot back issue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, just something to be aware of when uh, going for twenty bucks. But. The next one that we're going to talk about is Basket Full of Heads. A lot of people were getting that preview or whatever they call the advanced preview edition of this book. Sampler, I think they were calling it. Yes. But we actually have the release date. I like the cover A because of the story. But man, that Josh Middleton cover on there, any fan of Josh Middleton's picking that one up for sure. Yeah, and it's funny because we, I, we've talked about Josh Middleton on the, um, the former Hot and Cold show. Um, as being kind of a cold property, right? Josh Middleton just, I think, got overexposed a little bit, but it's not like the quality of his work has dropped, even in the slightest. I think anytime you have a Josh Middleton cover B, you're always going to get the attention, I think, of, of comic buyers. You Oftentimes, we come to a new release wall, and it's kind of a split-second decision, right? Um, do you go cover A, cover B, you're looking especially, at both? Especially in the dark. <laughs> yeah, especially, <laughs> especially everyone's out there the with their dark. cell phones today. <laughs> right, so you're going to have to make that pick, and I think Josh Middleton oftentimes is going to be the one people are going to pick. This book, to me, will be the litmus test for the Hill House imprint. Um, there is a lot of speculation going around um, about where Hill House could fit in the future. Um, I know that the Key Collector app, to bring them up again, they, again, no information behind it but just was speculating, just just kind of open-ended speculating on the app that Hill House um, imprint could possibly find its way onto HBO Max with the new streaming service, similar to the way Mark Millar got a deal with Netflix. Um, and I think that that's a fair speculation, right? And again, remember, guys, speculation at its core is a guess. It's an estimation. It's um, Swag. You know, it doesn't have to be based in um, – any sort of like factual um, knowledge based kind of information. So I think that's a fair speculation, um, but I think it's going to depend on the success of these early books. Um, they've certainly solicited a few more. We've talked about them on the last call show, uh, but I think this book is really going to be the litmus test. And it's going to take probably a few days for you to get a real judge of the reader buzz. And then moving right along, the next one on the reader buzz section was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number 99. This is a book I checked out that I think I, a lot of us were hoping maybe was going to have that moment in it, um, whether it's a death or some sort of character change. We didn't really get that, but we did get a little bit of a hint of where we're going with issue number 100. Now, it's not su- a surprise if you've paid attention to retail or variants because there are a few Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 100 retailer variants that have been put out that depict Shredder on the cover. So we kind of had the feeling that Shredder was coming back. And there was a, that last page splash page that kind of shows that it seems like Shredder may be getting summoned. Um, and if you, you know, if you're not familiar, Shredder died a good 50 issues ago. Um, he's been going through the Shredder in hell mini series. Um, so I think that that's what we're going to get with issue number 100 in some form or fashion. I have to say, though, having checked this book out, I love the color work in this book. 
it, the, the color work was outstanding. The way kind of like different panels were all one color, kind of shaded all in one color, and using those primary colors that each Ninja Turtle, um, you know, kind of is synonymous for, I, th I think was a very cool touch. Uh, you know, and again, that's something that maybe speculators could care less about, right? This is one of those books, similar to like when we talk about Venom, that speculators are jumping on every issue, buying up multiple copies, kind of feverishly waiting for which issue is going to be the one they're going to make money on. Um, and that's all guesswork, right? Nobody really knows. Um, we haven't heard any sort of concrete evidence on what issues what. But at the end of the day, I commend Tom Waltz and the team behind Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles who have put an amazing story together. Um, at the core of this channel, Brian, we're about the comics. We're about the love of the hobby. We're about reading. We're about the enjoyment that you get. This has been a fun storyline to read. Issue 99 was no different. I thoroughly enjoyed reading this issue. I'm excited for issue number 100. And if you're telling like a major story, right, that leads up to a major issue like issue 100, that's what issue 99 should be, right? You don't give it away now. It gets you hyped for the next issue. And that's what this issue did. Um, so I enjoyed it. I'll also say shout out to Frankie's Comics, who's got a really dope Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 99 Jenica variant. I love that cover. Um, really kind of dark and ominous. Uh, I think it's a great cover. And that is available right now at frankiescomics.com. Right. And I think it's cool. That's actually a Kevin Eastman cover. So, Yeah. Yeah, we haven't seen a ton of like Kevin Eastman draw on Jenica Turtle. So I think that that's really cool. It's funny because that Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is one of those franchises that always has the popularity and always has the friend, has the the true fans. I mean, to me, it was the cartoons, the comic series, but the way you're talking about how great the story's been so far, and then those those video games, those little stand up video games that came out, and one of them was Ninja Turtles. I forget the name of the brand. Uh, one Up Arcade. One Up Arcade. We actually just picked up the Marvel one for the kids. For my kids for Christmas, so I kind of wanted the Ninja Turtle one, but I, the Marvel one was cool. But oh man, Jackson and Jameson, I hope you guys aren't watching. Uh, yeah, watching the channel, man. No spoilers out here, right? <laughs> yeah, they're like, don't worry, they aren't. <laughs> they're my <laughs> damn TDM or FGTV <laughs> or any of those. But um, and by the way, I, I think I'm a little jealous of your kids that you picked that up, man. That thing's that's got I, that's on my list of of uh. Must get that, that Marvel one and that TMNT one. Definitely got to get the riser for it because at 6'3". Um, yeah, the risers are mandatory, <laughs> mandatory. And, you know, and shout out to my brother who's a mod in the chat, probably in the chat right now, Mark Define. He actually picked up the first uh, Ninja Turtles NES game when we were at Baltimore. $6 steal. So I think what you're saying is true. I think people connect with Ninja Turtles through different things. Some people through video games. Some people it was the Playmates toys. Some people it was the cartoon. Some people it was the original movie. Some the comics, and I think that's what makes the property successful. And it, I mean, it's great to see fans of all of it kind of come together and share everything about it. But, and shout out to uh, Comic Jabroni. I mean, yeah, he's always talking about turtles, and he even has. If you go to Comic Jabroni's YouTube channel, he even has a, he picked up that one up arcade, and he's got a, a video review on there. So uh, definitely check that out. But we're going to move right along. We're going to the next book on the Reader Buzz. And that is Conan the Barbarian number 10. I'm like two issues behind on this. But I did, did Conan the Barbarian and Savage Sword of Conan were two of my favorite books to pick up. I, actually, I still pick it up in my pool list. I went there today and got number 10. But I'm a couple issues behind. Oh, man. I feel kind of bad now that I'm going to spoil this for you here, bro. <laughs> That's all right. I mean, honestly, like, it's not much of a spoiler because if you read any of the solicitations for, say, 11 or 12, you know what's coming. But Conan dies in this issue. Um, and this is one of those books. I said there's a few books that we're going to talk about where there was a lot of fervor in the community. But again, you know what, man? And not to down speculators, but it's the speculators, man, who are so negative, Brian. It's never the readers because if you read this issue, it's a great issue. Um it's, it's the speculators who are saying things like, well, Conan's not going to stay dead. Man, of course Conan's not going to stay dead. They just paid a fortune for the property, right? They're not going to um, kill off Conan and that's going to be that. Uh, Conan the Barbarian and Savage Sword of Conan have been popular series. But this is a story, an encapsulated story that's being told. 
So for the purpose of this story, you know, that this is the point where Conan is dying. There's two more issues, and at least within those two issues we're seeing from solicitations of Conan's death is what they're talking about, how then the world deals with that death. But I think long-term, Marvel has plans for Conan. We've seen Conan in both the Avengers, uh, like the, what's it, the No Road Home? And Savage. And it, it's the Savage Avengers team. So th they're going to find ways to utilize Conan. Um, but nonetheless, this book got a lot of buzz when spoilers came out that Conan was dying in this issue. That, that, um, that last page leaked. I want to say Monday started hitting spec sites all over the internet. Um, and once that kind of attention went public, people who didn't normally have this on their pull list were grabbing this issue today um, and wanting to check it out. But this has been popular with readers. Uh, you know, it's been off the reader buzz section for a few weeks, a few months, as happens at, when you get to this level of the series eight, nine, you know, that kind of thing. And you're down to your diehard readers, but nothing like a major character death to, death to pop back up in the buzz. Yeah. I'm so upset you spoiled it for me. I mean, the cover A says final fate of Conan. I would have never deduced that he might die in it. He's such you an know? a <laughs> Right. Right, but you know, we all we know from other issues that just what they say it doesn't mean that it, you know it's what's going to happen. Uh, yeah, but you this is a Bendis book, <laughs> right? You and you and I got duped on uh, Doctor Strange. Oh yeah, uh, but uh, yeah. <laughs> but at the same point, yeah, this 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 delivered exactly what they were hinting at. So and then coming up on the next book on the reader buzz, we're getting going back to the future with some Marvel zombies. Right. Now, on the graphic, you saw that it was titled Respawn. The, the title on the book is actually Resurrection. They changed it. I don't know why. Maybe it had something to do with Todd McFarlane. Uh, maybe they didn't want to have the term Spawn on there. Maybe, you know, Respawn is popular in the video game community. But for whatever reason, the, the title got changed. This was popular for two, two counts. Number one, it was a reader buzz popular book. I think Marvel Zombies is one of the – it's funny. It's one of those miniseries when it came out. It was popular, and then people talked negatively about it for a number of years. And then suddenly now it became kind of like a cult classic where, you know, there was a real affinity for it. And then DC comes out with Deceased, and Marvel says, hold my beer because I'm coming back with Marvel Zombies. And uh, that you, you get this. And you also saw some variant buzz. I don't think any of the variants are going to truly pop on the secondary market. But I think they're going to be popular for some time with collectors. And we saw several of the different covers sell out at like major retailer level, which doesn't surprise me. Like I said, some great art. Uh, the several stores did store variants that got publicized pretty well um, throughout the community. But, My know, favorite Marvel's cover is actually that Enhyak Lee cover, though. So. Yeah. I'm, I, at this point, I think Enhyak Lee is one of the most consistently awesome cover artists in the, in the game. And the next one on the reader buzz, we're going back to Red Goblin as well with Red Goblin Red Death number one. Yeah, and this is one, right, we would have said there's no speculation to. Um, this was more about what it means for the character, right? It's funny that people talk so negatively at times about Red Goblin. But can I just say something? I actually did read this and I read another book and I actually enjoyed this book better than I did Venom number 19 this week. And that's what I was going to say is it's funny that people talk negatively about Red Goblin. And I think it's because – and again, I think it's the speculation community, Brian. I think it's the community that got burnt from amazing Spider-Man 798, 799, and 800. Um, so they've got a dog in the fight. I was one of those people who got burnt, but I'm still a fan of the character. I dig the character. I bought into the character because I liked that storyline. And I'm not a huge Amazing Spider-Man fan. So that was one of the few storylines that I was like, man, this is cool. Um, when we talked about this on the last call show, when we talked about this, when we posted the image for cover a on Instagram, on the comic book um, Instagram account, that was one of the most engaged posts that we've ever done on the account. And I'm talking about ever since the account started. And, um, that tells you how polarizing this, this character is. So I'm not surprised that people were picking up variants. I'm not surprised that there was a buzz behind it. 
people liked reading it, like you said. And you know what? There's also appeared to be a first appearance of a new symbiote child at the end of the book. So I, who knows whether in the future this book will have legs. We'll have to see. But th- there's definitely been some kind of late breaking buzz about that possible first appearance. Moving into the next book, we go with Silver Surfer Black number five. Now, this is another book where we're getting heavily debated about, is there a first appearance? So at the end of the book, the end of Donny Cates' um, Silver Surfer Black run up, a, uh, a story that I think most people have really enjoyed. Um, at the end, Silver Surfer appears to be black, right? He, he he's Even they have that little in the box you know, saying that he's black. Um, and of course we're talking about the color, not racially. Um, and he's kind of got this cool, uh, almost like multicolored sheen to him. Um, and is that a first appearance of a black silver surfer? I don't really know. Is this just the end of Donny Cates' story? Is this going to play out? Um, silver surfer is going to show up in the Avengers, uh, 29 in January. Um, I didn't see any cover art images, so I couldn't really tell. There wasn't any mention of him being black in the solicit, but I'm not really sure. So I'd love to hear from the community what you guys think. You know, Do you think this is a first appearance with legs? Is this just Donny Cates, the ending of his story? Um, is this something that they're going to pick up on later? There was a lot of variant buzz surrounding this. The two, the two books that you see with the, the, the surfboard kind of facing up, where I think it was like what Brian, like a one in two hundred and a one in four hundred or something like that. Yeah, something like huge, that. huge ratios. Um, gotta be honest with you, I don't love the depiction of Silver Surfer on those covers. He has kind of a Doctor Manhattan look to him. Um, but if the the surfboard is cool, where you get Galactus and Null respectively in the two in the two surfboards, I think that is very cool. Um, high ratio though, and we've talked about this before on the channel. High ratio books are just not trading for whatever the ratio is. You know, we talk, if you're not familiar with at ratio, when we say that, what we mean is if a book is a one in 25 variant, it, the old school approach used to be that the initial offering price would be whatever the ratio is. So if it's a one in 25 variant, it would be $25. If it was a one in 50 variant, it would be $50. But with the advent of more and more stores purchasing large quantities of books to attain these high ratio variants, and then feeling the pressure to move them to offset the costs of the books. We've seen a real decline in the initial offering prices of these variants. It's like they go kind of the more imbalance there is. So we're not seeing these sell on the secondary market at ratio, but time will tell, especially especially if this last page splash page is a truly a first appearance with legs. Right. I think those are usually the – superior collectors or i say superior you know the hardcore collectors that gotta have it at any cost special mm-hmm. release i'm also curious if there's people out there that are buying up these mary jane variants i'm sure marvel's making them so someone's gotta be buying them up they're not my cup of tea there's a few that i like um but let us know in the comments are you picking up these mary jane variants one of the ones i do like is actually for this next book that we're going to talk about and that of course is venom number 19 Oh, man, am I excited to talk about this book. Um, You said you liked Red Goblin better. I enjoyed reading this book. I think if you were able to remove – and I know you're not a – I'm not talking about you, Brad, because you're not really a speculator at heart. Um, But I think if we remove speculation from the topic of this book, I think this was a good issue. Um, I think that it it keeps developing the story. People want to blame Donnie Cates for being a salesman. Guess what? It's his job to sell books. So I don't really fault him. Um, people want to talk about the hype behind the Frankie's Comics variant, where you saw the Tyler Kirkham variant, where you saw the kind of eyes kind of glowing on the virgin version of that cover that you're showing right now. Well, guess what? We saw that even more in this book. Now, we've seen that kind of tease before, but we saw it even more. People are waiting for Dylan to take his final form. And no one knows when that's going to be. Um, did we talk about this one at last call? Yes. Did we talk about this being the possibility of being the issue where that happens? Yeah. We say we thought it might be. Absolutely. Especially once you saw like that variant. But either way, we know there's still absolute carnage number five. We know there's still um, 
Venom number 20. Daddy Cates has since said Venom number 20 is that go-to issue. That's the one you got to get. It's the one where things are going to be revealed. That hints that issue 20 is that issue. At the same point, again, Donny Cates is being Donny Cates, right? He's selling comics. So you just don't know whether, you know, as a speculator, you believe that. But at some point, I, I got to, this is where we, we like to be transparent, right, Brian? I'm not the guy buying 100 copies of these books, right? I'm not the guy who's pre-FOC telling you, you know, put put in your orders for two, 300 books. There's certainly people in other communities on Facebook or Patreon or, uh, you know, probably YouTube or somewhere, some corner of social media who advocate that type. That's a really difficult game to play. That's gambling. When you're getting to a point where you're trying to speculate like that on what it's going to be. I think if you bought three copies of this book because you thought it might happen and you came up short, hey, that's the game, right? I mean, how many times have we done that in our time as speculators, Brian? Probably dozens. Um, but the the anger that I'm seeing on social media from people that this issue didn't turn out the way they wanted it to kind of makes me scratch my head and go, you know, we've seen this, right? We've seen this throughout the storyline. I wish people would understand this is the way Donny Cates tells a story. Um, if he gave you everything you wanted right now, what would necessarily be the incentive for to like build hype for those next two issues? So he's giving us little pieces at a time. Think about it like a Netflix TV series if you're binging a series. That crescendo is going to happen at the end. He's going to give us little pieces and little pieces each in each episode to get us where we want to go. Um, but I think that this issue has been – this issue was good. I think it's underrated. Um, I know that a lot of you don't agree. A lot of you hated this issue. And I respect that. Everybody's entitled to their opinion. Um, but I think that most of that comes from that speculation community who's just got money tied up in something, trying to make it into something. Um, either way, I like the Tony Moore Codex variant. Um, I'm, a, I'm a fan of Flash Thompson's Agent Venom. You can tell speculation drove up that initial offering price because we saw Midtown Comics offer that book at $34 for initial offering. We saw people pre-selling that book for as much as $45, $50 on eBay, and now that price has dropped. Um, I do not like these Mary Jane variants, but I love this one. This one's absolutely gorgeous. Um, just incredible cover art. Uh, it's ominous. It's dark. It's got a little bit of sex appeal. Um, I think it's great. And then you know, also, there you go. Look at that, that Virgin cover. Um, again, you know, shout out to Frankie's Comics, who has an exclusive on this one. They did a great job with the Virgin on this one. Um, but, you know, again, I think that, th that people are being really kind of hard on this issue in this situation. And I think if you're able to step back, man, and just remember why we love comics and we love reading stories and stories developing – I think that you'll realize that the only reason to be mad is because this one didn't turn out the way you want it to financially, um, which I know is why some of you are here, but it's not what it's all about. We always say, buy what you like. And even if you do like it and you like it for speculation, I'm one of those guys, I don't buy in more than what I think is something. I never buy in extremely heavy on a book ever just because I don't like losing money that. I could spend somewhere else on other stupid things. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I'm not a gambler, yeah. so I'm not me either. I'm not. I'm not the guy advocating those hundred book pre-orders. You know, that's not me. That's not somebody else. So it's not. I'm not. Um, at people getting upset about that. I don't know, man. That's you're. Anytime you do that, you're going to be taking a risk. But anyways, we're going to move on in the next book we're going to talk about is plot number two from Vault Comics. Yeah, plot number one was a really hot book, right? It, it, it really um, surprised many in that a lot of Vault books didn't shoot up in value. The also, way that and I also hear mixed. Some people really love it, and then some people think it's basically printed toilet paper i actually enjoyed it i haven't had a chance to read issue number two yet but i did enjoy the first issue we actually was actually able to read like an advanced pdf copy of that but uh -huh. i enjoyed it looking forward to reading issue number two i have it upstairs 
sitting on the shelf, just haven't had an opportunity yet. Yeah, and I definitely we've heard the same thing, right? Um, plot number one, all three covers did well. Uh, you know, a couple stores did exclusives that seemed to do pretty well. The NYCC variant was limited to 100. Um, it was sold at New York Comic Con for 100. Is now selling for, I want to say like 175 to 200. So it's selling for over what you would say the you know the ratio of the asking price was. So the book did well. Um, yeah, mixed mixed results. But it seems like kind of like what you said is if people love it, they love it. If they hate it, they hate it. It's kind of one of those polarizing topics. But anytime people are so strongly one direction or the other, you're going to see kind of a buzz. And that's why the book's on this list. Um, and you're going to see us talk about the plot again later. Right. Then the last book on the reader buzz, this is one independent that I do actually really like. And that's Psycho List. This is issue number three. This is one of those ones that... I a lot of comic stores don't order because it's one of those smaller independent press. But if you get a chance, get an opportunity to read this book, fantastic story. We always talk about how horror comics are kind of making that resurgence right now. And this is definitely one that's worth reading. Yeah, this is, I've mentioned this on the channel before. I really like their other book, Militia. It's written by Chuck Dixon. Um, this is a newer, small press publisher. I think people kind of take a prove it to me approach. So it's like you said, um, orders were kind of small. People couldn't get issue number one. So then it's harder for people to jump on issues two and three. Um, I think Black Box did a good job getting that that second print for issue number one out there um, and giving readers an opportunity to on board. Uh, but yeah, this has been a hit. We just talked about a book where people either love it or hate it. It seems like everybody who reads this book loves it. Um, the doubt comes from those who haven't read it, who are like, why are people talking about this indie book? But issue number one shot up to like $20, $30. Issue number two did a similar. Um, I haven't seen where this one is selling, um, but I would imagine that because of how tough it is to get at retail in a lot of places in the country, I wouldn't be surprised if this one goes over cover as well. Right. And if you can't get it at your local comic store, hopefully – Black Box will put out a trade of it once it's all done. I highly recommend you guys pick that up and give it a read because um, I've enjoyed it so far. Yeah, and also check out the publisher's website because they also, when issue number one was selling for like $30, they had cover, they had that cover available on their website for a while afterwards. So we've advocated that a lot. Like Anytime you can't find something at retail, check that. It's, it's just when you're talking indie publishers, check their website because a lot of times their web stores will have books in stock and people just aren't aware of it. Right. And that wraps up the reader buzz section tonight. We're just going to go right now into the variant buzz section. We talked about plot number two, but also this week, plot number one, the second print just came out. And it's got that whole EC Comics look to it, huh? Yeah, very cool. Very cool homage, in my opinion. I think... Uh, the EC homage is a well-placed homage for this book. I think that, uh, you know, this is kind of an old-school horror book. We saw the Swamp Thing homage do really well. Um, I think that this one is cool. I think the fact that it's a second print, kind of reminiscent of the original Vault Vintage variants, which were second prints, I think has a good chance long-term because, I, you know, I don't, I'm not sure how many of these will be ordered in comparison to those first prints. But definitely cool if you didn't get a chance to get number one, if you didn't want to pay like $15 for number one, now you got a chance to grab this. And I've talked about this before, Brian. I love when they release the second print of number one the same day. They release number two, gives you an opportunity. If Man, if you missed out, if you didn't want to chase it on eBay, for whatever reason, now you got an opportunity to pick up both books, get home, get caught up, and then make your decision whether or not this is something you want to add to your pull list or not. Right. And it's also important to know we talk about independent comics and how some local comic stores don't order them. But the good thing is, is Vault actually gets to participate in FOC with Diamond right now. So a lot of times this is one of those books that we try to bring attention to the viewer and let them know, hey, this book's coming out. If your store doesn't order these, it might be something you're interested in and let your local comic shop know so they can get that order in for you. Absolutely. That's one of the purposes, right, behind the last call show when we came up with it, you know, a lot of people weren't happy originally that we, but then 
that kind of has subsided and now people are starting to see the value in that, um, that we wanted to do that show to let the community know about books just like this, where, you know, they need to let their retailer know if they want to not play that Wednesday warrior game where you may miss out. So the next one for variant buzz this week is vampire state building number two. This had four different variants for it. I actually really love that. King Kong type homage swipe. That would be the one that I like out of all these. But to fully admit, I haven't picked up issue one and not really excited to pick up number two. I might eventually and, and give this story a read, but it has it's not on my radar yet. Yeah, you and I were both um skeptical of issue number one, right? We thought we felt like they were kind of heavily selling The Walking Dead. This had kind of a V Wars, um the strain vibe to it. Um, we were both really questioning how a story that takes place in one building would really have any sort of long-term value, but they've definitely done the marketing with the variants. We've seen uh, variants for issue number one do well. These variants here with issue number two are doing well. And it's that funny how you're seeing white- this this uh, frenzy of glow-in-the-dark variants come back. We see multiple. Yep. Um, that cover on the far right is a glow-in-the-dark variant, by the way, and it, it's crazy. Um Andy comic and Andy on the hot and cold show a couple weeks ago talked about how those 90 gimmicks were hot again and glow in the dark covers is definitely one of those. Yeah, for sure. Uh, that is definitely one of those gimmicks that's made a kind of a comeback, uh, through a couple different, um, releases. And we've seen it, whether it was with ghost rider with the New York comic con variant, um, some of the most recent releases and, you know, it's got like a $20 asking price for the initial offering kind of steep. And I think for that reason, we're seeing people trend towards maybe some of those cover price variants, like you mentioned, the King Kong homage, or um, like I was going to say that that black and white cover that's like second from the right yeah. that's done. Almost like done was kind it of, like Nosferatu or something? Yeah, kind of that Nosferatu um, kind of cover is, that's done pretty well. But yeah, you know what, Brian, this is what I'm going to read. Right, I don't want to keep being negative about this book and saying why we didn't like it uh, because we need, neither of us have read it, right? So it could be the greatest thing since sliced bread. This is one I'm going to wait for the trade for, though. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just check out the story. It's just it's not one of those ones I've been hyped, and I'm not don't mean that in a negative way. It's just with all the books that come out, I got a budget. <laughs> this yep. is one that we all do. Budget. So, and. Everything else on the Variant Buzz Bolo list we've actually discussed previously in the show, so that wraps up the Variant Buzz section for the show. But, as always, we're going to go into Jack's Long-Term Play of the Week. And this is an independent book from Mad Cave Studios, and we're talking about Woven Heart number one. All right, this is a book that I've been um, excited to check out ever since CBSI owner Ben C sent me kind of the initial PDF talking about this book when, you know, he pitched the idea of doing the variant cover that you see on the screen, the comicbookinvest.com, um, to the comicbookinvest.com Tomb of Dracula um, homage cover that we've got there. This book has a kind of a unique concept. It uses a lot of public domain style characters where we've got Van Helsing in this book as kind of like the elder statesman. Wolvenheart is essentially a team. It's kind of an Avengers team of monster hunters led by the main character, Sterling Cross. Um, This is a team that's kind of monitoring all kind of aberrations through time. They're going to face some of kind of the most infamous, you know, villains and monsters uh, throughout history. This is another book where we've heard people positive about this book, very, some very positive and some very negative. And I think that it's tough when you get that kind of a reaction for an issue number one. The reason why I have this book sl- slotted as our long-term play of the week is when you look at the releases this week, right, there isn't a book on there. It's a lot of issue number twos, a lot of issue number threes. You're talking about a death in Conan. We're talking about a Venom book that didn't hit the way people wanted. We're talking about a TMNT book that didn't hit the way people wanted. I think Excalibur maybe caught people a little bit off guard. So you can make an argument for that. But there isn't really a clear-cut long-term play. It's just one of those weeks, and that's how things sort of go. This is a book, while Mad Cave has yet to have a property option, that has a premise 
that could certainly work within a movie or television show. We've seen these kind of like the Helsing monster hunter type uh, stories, vampire hunter type stories. We're certainly getting that in MCU with Blade, right? So we've seen these kinds of stories do well, but we haven't seen this like team aspect of it. That's a, that's a unique approach to it um, where we have, you know, kind of people of different age groups, male, female, um, and, and we talk about all the time on the channel, horror is hot. So I enjoyed issue number one. I, I heard a lot of feedback from people, like I said, who enjoyed it, a lot of feedback from people who didn't. I would hope that the people who didn't enjoy it would maybe stick around and check out issue number two because it's tough when you're setting up a book like this. You've got to kind of build the world that these people live in. And Mark London has a distinct style, way the way he's telling his stories. While he's told stories in many different genres, he kind of builds out that world and then leads you down that path. So I've got faith in Mark London because I've enjoyed Battle Cats. I've enjoyed Knights of the Golden Sun. Um, so I feel good about trusting him and where he's going with this story. But again, I, I know that there are some people that haven't been positive about this book, but another thing I like about Mad Cave is you're talking about low print runs. So if this book hits, you're going to be talking about a book that's not going to be easy to get. This isn't going to be one you're going to find at every LCS. And then the, the store variants that were created for this book all carry extremely low print runs of like 250 or less. We saw One Stop Shop do a variant. We saw um, Black Cape Comics did a variant. And then the comicbookinvest.com variant that you see right there, you're talking about a trade dress print run of 150. You're talking about a virgin print run of 50 uh, available to the public. So um, I think the total print run on the virgin is like 100. So at that point, you're you're you know, you're talking micro print runs, um, and that Virgin cover is probably the most limited cover of this book in total. And it's important to note, ComicBookInvest.com actually lowered the price of this book today. Um, they they did a lot of work getting the, their pricing kind of down overall across the variant program. So now this book is available. For eleven dollars for the trade dress and thirty dollars for the set, which I think is a fabulous price on the set of two. And if you already ordered the book, they refunded the difference on people who had pre-ordered at the higher original offering price. So this book is still available. And if you like the book, if you believe in this book as a spec play, I would check that out for sure. That's comicbookinvest.com. Just click that variant tab. They're available now. Right, and I'm of the same frame of mind as you mentioned earlier. Is if I start a book, I at least read it through the first arc before I kind of just completely drop it. But uh, this is one of the ones. I'm also a big fan of that whole period and period piece horror type. This is one of the ones that, like you said, we've been talking about since June when it kind of started coming out on the radar. And yeah. people were talking about it. So we're really excited about it. Um, that sneak preview. Yeah. And you did get mixed reviews. But I think that's that could be good as well because – if you try to write a book to please everyone, a lot of times you please nobody. Yep. I mean, there's a few outliers out there. It's just, they're that big, but these are the type, especially with this subject matter. And like I said, this period piece, there's going to be a lot of people out there. Like it's not for me. Just like I was just saying, vampire state building isn't for me, but this is one where I'm actually on the other side of the coin where woven hearts, one of those ones I'm excited about and really enjoyed the story on it. And I'd like to see where it goes. Cause total faith in Mark London. Um, yeah. Huge fan of his. That kind of got me on to my love for Mad Cave because for the most part, he's been the main writer for their titles. <coughs> One book that you didn't mention that I really like that I thought I wouldn't like was Honor and Curse. That's true. I was like, I don't know about this whole samurai supernatural, but enjoyed it. In fact, shame to say, I bought one book at Baltimore Comic Con and that was Honor and Curse Trade Paperback Volume Number One from the Mad Cave booth because I just didn't get to do all the digging. But that's but that's what's amazing I think about Mark London and how talented he is that he's got you know a horror book that he's got kind of a um, samurai um, kind of Asian influence type type supernatural story. Epic he's got religious, epic religious story, and then kind of like uh, again a. Uh, uh, animal based fantasy book right so like just how cool is it that you can play in all of those worlds 
um, and tell stories successfully and all those words. It's also important to note that we, when we were in Baltimore and we talked with the Mad Cave folks, they said that this was the most in-demand release that they've had at, to date upon this being released. Now, they did also tell us that their next book, Over the Ropes, coming in December, um, the wrestling story, which I know you and I are excited for, looks like it may surpass it, but Mad Cave definitely is trending in the right direction. Right. And with that, that's Jack's long-term play for the week, and that kind of sums up the Bolo list. I'll go ahead and bring it up on the screen one more time. But So the, we had the first appearances. We talked about the Reader Buzz. And let us know in the comments what books did you guys pick up this week? What book did you enjoy reading? Um, was there a book that you liked that w wasn't on the list? Let us know because that's how the books end up making the list, especially in the Reader Buzz section. Once again, like I said earlier, immediately following this show, there will be that back issue Bolo show going up, right, Jack? Yep. We're going to premiere that right after the show. Well, not premiere, but it's, it's premiering for the first time right after this show. Five back issues to be on the lookout for. When you're hunting these new comic book day books, you guys have let us know you want some back issues to check out. So we're giving you five. And this week, it's Modern Marvels, books that have come out since about 2015. A lot of books that you can find for cover price or less, some variants that are at ratio or less that very well could pay dividends in the long run. So we're excited to debut that back issue Bolo show tonight right here on the Simpleman's Comics YouTube channel. Right, and real quick before we let you go, make sure you guys tune in tomorrow night for the premiere of The Last Call. Where we're going to be talking about Final Order Cutoff books hitting Final Order Cutoff this coming Monday. That's tomorrow night. 9 p.m., that one is still a premiere. This show and the FOC show are the ones we're going to be premiering. Everything else now is going to be scaled down, smaller, digestible content, and lets us create more content for the channel. So if you haven't, make sure you subscribe. That way you get notified whenever future content hits the channel. You can call me stupid. Yes, you can call me sheep. You can say I